Thank you very much. It's really exciting to be here, and it's really good to be in a room with so many young people that are passionate about research. I go out and talk quite a lot to people who are in schools, and I often put together a sort of specific talk for school students, and I thought who was going to be in front of me today, and the fact that you're all much more skilled in research and passionate about it than the normal people that I talk to that what I put together is really a version of the kind of thing that I'd go and talk to other scientists about at conferences. But I want to tell you the story of why I do the research as well as some of the research that we do. And as, as was said, I work in the chemistry department here. I'm an academic, so my job is teaching students, but it's also running a research team, raising funding, and doing cutting edge research. And the research that I'm gonna show you, although based in chemistry, links to biology, and medicine, and there's even a bit of physics and engineering in there as well. And that's what modern science is like. It's super interdisciplinary. It uses lots of different skills to try and solve problems that you're interested in. So what problems am I interested in? Well, it all stems from something quite personal. So this is a picture of me and my husband, Sam. And as I always say when I show this picture, I say, you can tell from this picture that I'm gay, because like, fabulous shoes um, <laughs> and shirt. Um, and you can see this was the closest you could get to your minster on your wedding day, if you were gay, and then we got chased off the steps just after that uh, for the photos. <laughs> what you can't see is anything about Sam in this picture. And Sam has cystic fibrosis, uh, and so this is an x-ray of the lungs, and as you may well know, cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease, and because of the faulty gene that makes a faulty protein in your lungs, you get mucus building up around the cells in your lungs, bacteria grow in that mucus that gives you repeated infections, and ultimately that leads to scarring of the lungs, and that lung damage is what kills patients with cystic fibrosis. And the average life expectancy for a CF patient in the UK at the moment is just under 40 years. So this is just a slide showing the kind of drug burden that a cystic fibrosis patient will take, and showing some of the effects that cystic fibrosis faulty gene has. It has effects in numerous parts of the body, the gallbladder, the pancreas, trouble with digestion, a slightly enlarged heart, but the key thing, as I've said, are these frequent lung infections that you get, which ultimately damage the lungs and lead to lung failure and death. So there are many ways of trying to treat the symptoms of cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis patient take lots of antibiotics to deal with the lung infections, but increasingly there's an interest in medication that treats the causes of cystic fibrosis, and some drugs are beginning to come onto the market that do that. We're particularly interested, or we became interested after I met Sam, in using a genetic approach to treating cystic fibrosis. Okay. So you'll know that DNA is coded with biological information. And as I've said, cystic fibrosis patients have a faulty bit of DNA. So what you'd really like to do is take a healthy bit of DNA and get it into the lungs of the patient or the body of the patient more generally so that you can fix the faulty DNA with the healthy DNA. This would be called gene therapy, which some of you, I'm sure, will know about from even some of the research that you've been doing. Now, if you want to use DNA as a drug, there's some really significant problems that you got to solve. The first thing is DNA is not stable in the human body. You need to protect and package it. You can think of the DNA double helix as being like this tube of fruit pastels. Okay? And if I take a tube of fruit pastels and you're a human body and I want to treat you with the DNA and as a doctor I would kind of go to the mouth. So we'll have Laura as the mouth here and I'll say there you go. Here is your drug. Here's the DNA. You can take one or two, and then you can have it. You can pass it on. And this is what the body does as you take a drug. If the body can chew up the drug, then it will do it. Your body has evolved, actually, to protect you from all sorts of stuff that you put into yourself. Your liver, that's why your liver gets damaged if you drink too much. Your liver's there chopping up drugs. And DNA is super sensitive to everything in your body that gets chopped up. Your body protects DNA very carefully inside the nucleus of the cell. It's not supposed to be just floating around in your bloodstream. So how would you solve that kind of problem if you wanted to use DNA as a drug? You can't just put some DNA into a patient and hope it's going to get into the cells and start expressing proteins and curing the patient, as we'll see in a minute. 
What you do in the real world is you take your DNA, because there's going to be none of it left. If I want to treat the lungs in the back corner, let's say, over there, they're not going to get any of this dose of DNA. So what you do in the real world is you take an envelope, right? you take a second dose of the DNA, you'd find a target, so I just need a name from the back corner. Anybody? Shout out. Who is that? Sorry? Connor? Marvellous? That's good enough. Connor? You're just about to get a whole load of fruit pastels. And you write Connor Evans, and I'd write sort of, well, for me, it's the left, and it's the middle, and it's the back. So I'd inform my packaging about what it has to do, and then I would put the drug within the packaging, and I would seal it up, and I'd give it, there we go. And now they can't eat that drug. Your body can't destroy the drug because you've protected it and you've packaged it, and you're going to carry it to where it's needed. And this is the way we try and approach, oh, it's going around the house, it's going via Australia, um, <laughs> all the way along to Connor, who's here in the blue. And what happens when the DNA gets to its site of action, right, is it normally spreads around that local area just a little bit. I don't expect you to eat the entire packet of fruit pastels yourself. So share them around once you've got there. But this is the idea. You want to protect and package this really sensitive material. You want to get it into the cells that you want to treat. And then you want to turn the code into an enzyme that will do the job that was not being done in the cells, which was why the patient was getting mucus around the cells. And if you can do all that, you can treat the patient. Right? That would treat the cell. And what we're looking at in particular is temporarily treating a cell. We're not looking at permanently changing the germline of the DNA here that would go on for replication. So this would be a treatment that the patient would take monthly or bi-monthly. And so to do that, you need a way of protecting and packaging DNA. I showed you an envelope for some fruit pastels. How would we interact something with DNA? DNA, for a person, is unimaginably small, right? It's really tiny. It's in this nanometer length scale. For a chemist like me, that's pretty big. A covalent bond is this long, 0.1 of a nanometer. This is 1 nanometer. This is 100 nanometers. DNA is sort of in this range. So as a chemist, you need something quite big to go and interact with DNA. And one way of doing that is to have something with lots of arms that can stick to the biomolecule that you want to bind. And because it forms multiple interactions, we call it multivalent, because it forms multiple interactions, it binds nice and strongly, and it can begin to wrap it up and package up that DNA that we want to treat the patient with. So we did this, and this was our first attempt. And I don't want you to worry about the chemical detail here. We call this molecule the nonopus because it has nine arms, right? So it's like octopus plus one. And each arm has been carefully selected because it wants to bind to DNA. The reason for that is these arms are all positively charged, and DNA is negatively charged. So these amines in these arms, if you're a Sixth form student, you might know these are amines. They're positively charged, and they bind to the negatively charged DNA. Positive attracts negative, and there's multiple interactions. And what happens? This is it being modeled uh, in a computational simulation. We work with collaborators that do computational science in Italy. Sabrina Prickle, great friend of mine, models what's going to happen for us. And then it packages it up uh, into a ball. So this is the idea that I've just shown you. You've got something with lots and lots of arms, and it goes and binds to a biological molecule. And it works quite well. And you can package up the DNA and carry it around. But it's quite hard to make the nonopus. It's quite big. It's quite complicated. It's got lots of arms. It takes a lot of effort. And we wanted to make life a bit simpler for ourselves. So we said, couldn't we make a nonopus that kind of just assembles itself from tiny little bits, like using molecular Lego to make our structure. It would save us a lot of work because we'd only have to make a small thing that would then be able to do the same effect. And we think of this as being something that we call self-assembled from molecules. And if it's self-assembled and it's multivalent, we said, well, then this we could call it Samuel. And we can name this whole concept after my husband, which we did. And this is good because this just assembles. You just make the molecule, put it in water, and it forms these structures. It's very tunable. You can put different things on here. You can change it around. Oops. Just that 
range. Um, you get different shapes that you can make. And in principle, you can make this whole thing fall apart afterwards so it has no toxic effects and doesn't stay in the body. And so we wrote papers and we said self-assembled multivalency and called it Samuel um, after my husband. The idea of self-assembly using molecules is just like this picture. Imagine this is a molecule that we made in the lab, an individual molecule, this crocodile. And what we do, we put it into our system. They all interact with one another and they assemble into a beautiful structure here because they're perfectly complementary to binding to one another. So we're assembling molecules in this kind of way. And to, without too much detail, to cut a long story short, this works. We design a molecule that we think will stick together. And it sticks together because of this bit that's kind of like glue. And all these tails want to come together because they hate the water and they bury themselves in the middle. And we look down an electron microscope. And what you see here is little balls that are 10 nanometers in size. And that's exactly what this looks like. It's about 10 of those molecules coming together, forming a ball um, with all of our DNA binding bits on the outside. So here's a model. All the DNA binding bits on the outside, and you can see it binding to the DNA double helix. Okay? So this is a really nice, easy system now to make. You can make this in a few steps for a chemist. This is quite easy to make. It's got the same DNA binding bits, but it's just assembling itself. It's doing the work for us. And I don't want to go through this in too much detail, but by doing this, you take something that's a bit rubbish at binding to DNA, because it's only got three arms after all, and once you put this bit on, it becomes really good at binding DNA because it assembles into this nano-sized ball, and so it binds to the DNA really strongly. We design other features into our molecules, so we're always thinking about how we make our molecules and what they can do. So you put some bonds in that can break down over time, and we can look at that using a range of experiments, and the systems we make degrade over about 12 hours. So if you use this system to deliver DNA into a patient's lungs, over about a 12-hour period, the envelope just degrades away to nothing. And it will release the free DNA so the DNA can do its job within the cell. This is exactly what you'd want your envelope to do. If the envelope just sticks around, how's the DNA ever going to get out and do anything in the cells of the patient? And where we've taken this project to, that's just a model there, actually, of all of the arms falling off and then the DNA getting released from the system. And where we've taken this system to is we've done some animal studies with collaborators over in Germany, working in Berlin, Rainer Haag's group, uh, and they adapted our design. We worked with them. We made the design as good as we could. So you'll see if you're really into the chemical detail, there's slight differences now to the molecule I showed you before. But it's doing exactly the same thing. It's got arms. It's assembling into a ball. It's binding to DNA or RNA, packaging it up. And then it's doing cellular delivery. And then it's got bonds in here that can be broken down to release the DNA. And what we showed, importantly, in this study is that unlike lots of other ways of delivering DNA that you can use, like viruses and things, there was no immune response of this system. Uh, so our system is the green bars here. A competitor DNA delivery system is this black bar, and you can see there's a big immune response in this case. Very often, if you try and develop a system to get DNA into an animal or a person, they have a big immune response to it. And in this case, we have no immune response, and we're beginning to deliver DNA into the cells. And we're continuing to deliver this uh, and develop this to treat patients. So that's the one of the two stories that I want to tell you. But resetting, personal life moves on. So when I met Sam in 2005, he had cystic fibrosis. And so I became very interested in how can I use the skills that I've got in chemistry. I knew all about how to make molecules bind to one another. And so we thought, well, let's bind DNA and get it into the body and use my knowledge to solve the problem of cystic fibrosis or to try to gain some progress in that field. But in about 2010, Sam's lungs were failing shortly after we got married. So this is Sam on oxygen 24 hours a day. And then he had a lung transplant up at Newcastle. 
um, in 2011. This is a selfie that he took 24 hours after a lung transplant. It's quite a cool environment for a chemist like me to be in. There was loads and loads of drugs all going in, and I could learn all about them. And I talked to the doctors, and I talked to the surgeons. And one thing I'd say to you is, wherever you are in life, you can always learn science. There's always stuff that you can try and understand and try and know what's going on. Okay? But there are some problems with lung transplantation. One is the waiting list to get to the lungs. And one is you have to have somebody else's lungs inside your body. And once you've got that, your body's going to permanently reject them. And you have to take medication for the rest of your life to try and stop the rejection from becoming too bad. So this is where Sam had that transplant done up in Newcastle. And I learned lots about transplantation, a field that I'd never known about before. And what they said is, it would be really fantastic for transplantation if we didn't have to wait for organs to come onto the market. If we could take cells and grow them in some sort of matrix, and then what you'd do is you'd get your cell matrix construct and you'd implant it into the patient, then you wouldn't have to wait for the organs to come available. You could actually grow an organ in a laboratory and put it into a patient. It would revolutionize transplant medication. And to do that, you need some sort of matrix. And we're very interested in how nanomaterials assemble. I've just shown you some self-assembly with our crocodiles. And making matrices is the kind of thing we can potentially do. A smart matrix could encourage cells to do really clever things. And the kinds of things that make good matrices are gels. Now, I know that this is probably an experiment you've all seen before, but I love doing it, so I'm going to do it again. Um, and we're going to make a gel, because I'm going to show you it's really easy to make gels. So we've got here one solution. This is alginic acid, so it's a seaweed extract. Um, so you could drink this. I'm not going to, because this is lab grade, not food grade. But it's alginic acid, seaweed extract. And the other solution that I've got here is just calcium chloride. And again, that can be potentially food grade as well, although this is just from my lab. Um, and this is why I don't need to wear safety, uh, uh, I don't need to wear gloves or safety glasses for this, because these are food grade chemicals. I don't need a lab grade. Okay? Um, alginic acid, calcium chloride, if you mix them together, just pouring one into the other, give them a swirl, then what happens is the calcium interacts with the alginic acid, and you make a gel type material in situ. It's not difficult to make gels. Gels are kind of a mixture of a solid-like material and a liquid-like material. And in principle, I could take this blob and try and grow cells on it and try and get those cells to do things, right? But this is not a very smart gel. It just formed where I poured one solution into the other. I don't have much control over it. And I've not really programmed the chemistry to do anything that I'd want it to do. And if you want to grow something as sophisticated as an organ, you need to have gels that are much more effective than this one in order to do that. So, just to recap, the second area of sort of nanoscience that we're working on related to Sam's healthcare is not gene delivery, it's organ engineering. The advantages of growing an organ outside a patient from their own stem cells, right, are twofold. You get the organ when you need it. You wouldn't have to wait for a donor. And because you've grown the organ from a patient's own stem cells, stem cells are kind of progenitor cells. You can find them in bone marrow um, and other places. And they can turn into any other kind of cell. They can turn into all the cells that your body would need if you treat them right. And you get no rejection because you're using the patient's own cells to grow the organ. There are the advantages on patient survival. There's a massive economic advantage. The cost of anti-rejection drugs for a patient is £10,000 a year. So after transplant, the patient's still costing you £10,000 a year, and you would simply remove that. If you could engineer organs for patients, there'd be no ongoing cost for that medication. So what we like to do is use soft, self-assembled materials to program cells, right? And to allow our chemistry to impact on biology and create organs 
to go into patients. Now, that's, it has to be said, that's massively ambitious. That's like a 20 to 30 year plan. You know, gene delivery is beginning to happen. You're beginning to see gene engineering of patients in the clinic, right? Not our system, but other people's systems. You're beginning to see it in the clinic now. Organ engineering is probably a minimum 10 years down the line for the very simplest organs. So how might we do this? Well, again, if you want to interact with cells, cells have proteins and membrane bilayers. So you need something that can go and interact with proteins and membrane bilayers. You need something in the nanometer regime, something nano-sized, tiny compared to us, quite big compared to a single molecule. And one of the things that we specialize in in my group is self-assembly. And we self-assemble molecules into big, long fibers. And once you do that, the materials form gels. It's a bit like doing knitting or something. As the molecules go into a fiber and they wrap around one another, you make the whole thing into a solid, a soft, solid material held together by these self-assembled fibers. So we thought, well, we can use this technology to make gels. But we don't just want to make a gel like these kinds that are very easy to make. We want to make something that's sophisticated, that we can begin to do smart things with, that we can begin to pattern in some sort of way, so that we could change how the cells behave on different bits of our material to try and direct stem cells to do one thing on one bit of a material and another thing on another bit of material. And in that way, you might be able to engineer something more sophisticated. Anyway, where do we start? Well, we make gels, and I'm a chemist, so we need a gelator to make. And we use, uh, we make gels based on a technology that's been known for over 100 years. So one of the really important things in terms of science is to read what people have done before. And I knew that in 1892, a French scientist found that if you mixed sorbitol, which is a very simple sugar, with benzaldehyde, you made this molecule, two equivalents of this, one goes on here, one goes on there, so you're acting these and these with this. You make this molecule, it looks a bit like a butterfly, and it formed a gel. He wrote at the end of his procedure, une gelée transparente, in this paper in French from 1892. And industry used these things quite a lot. Uh, if you have um, a right guard deodorant roll-on, this is what's holding that gel together in a right guard deodorant roll-on. Okay. It looks a bit like this if we draw the real structure of the molecule out. So I hope you can see it really does look a bit like a butterfly with two wings. Why does a molecule like this, when you drop it into a solvent, form a gel? Well, the reason is the butterflies stack up with one another. All those aromatic groups stack up, and the body, which is made of the sugar, they all stack up and form hydrogen bond interactions with one another. And this is just the kind of chemistry that I specialize in. How does this molecule interact with this molecule is really what gets me excited. So, the problem is, all the industrial applications of this butterfly work in solvents that are not water. So the right guard deodorant has some alcohol in the, in the deodorant stick. This won't stack into its fibers just in water. But cells want to grow in water. Okay? If you're going to do tissue engineering and work with stem cells, your system has to work in water. So how do we change our butterfly to make it work in water? Well, this is the kind of thing we understand in my lab very well. Uh, and fundamentally, what you want to change is the wings of the butterfly. If you make them a bit more fabulous, right? It's the wings that interact with the solvent that these fibers are forming in. And it's exactly what we did. On the wing tips, we just changed the chemistry a little bit and put something that was a bit more compatible with water. And all of these form beautiful gels in water. Okay. So by tuning the chemistry, you can change the way the material behaves in different environments. So instead of being just suitable for deodorant sticks that are a mixture of alcohol and water, we can now make things that just work in water. And what we showed very early is that on one of these, we could grow cells. That was the most important thing to do. This is not, in and of itself, very exciting. Cells grow on quite a lot of gels. I could probably grow some cells on this stuff that I've got here. But it's very important to show that what you've made is biocompatible. 
and it is, right? So these are just very simple mouse fibroblasts growing on our material. And then we bring all kinds of different technologies to bear. So you can imagine self-assembling a gel and perhaps mixing it with some sort of gel like this. Maybe if you use light to assemble one of the gel networks, then we can begin to use physics and engineering to control how we mix these things together. And we can make gels with different properties. We can make things that are responsive, things that are robust, and we can begin to get mixed systems. As a chemist, one of the things we really love in my lab is mixing different chemistries together and understanding how they cooperate with one another to make more complex systems. And ultimately, this is what we can do. So I'll just show you a, an experiment. You can take two different systems that could form gels. You allow a gel to form in one of them. So you've now got a nice dish of gel. And then you put a mask on the top. So this is where the engineering comes in. And you shine a UV light on top of your mask. And where the UV light's gone through, the second gel is able to form. So you can pattern like one material into another material. When we do this, oh, this is just an example. I, we patterned a very simple Y into a tray of gel. The surrounding bit is really soft. It's kind of like snot or something like that. You just kind of scrape it up. But the bit in the middle is nice and robust. And you can lift it out. And it's very, so they have different physical properties depending on what we've patterned into the system. And so we can pattern quite sophisticated things. This is the eye of Horus being patterned into one of our trays ready for tissue growth. And the idea here is you've got one gel here and a different gel here. And you can load these up with different things. And you want to make the cells do different things here <coughs> to what they do here to what they do here. And then you want to encourage those cells to communicate with one another and to develop into a more complex object. So rather than just making a gel, we're fabricating gel materials. And we're beginning now to grow stem cells on these. So this is an image of human mesenchymal stem cells growing on one of our hybrid materials. And we see that on the different domains, with, uh, you can't see it in this image, we're beginning to get different behavior of the stem cells within these materials. And again, we've not published this. So you're now right at the point of where we are in the cutting edge of this project. This is exactly what the research in my lab are doing right now. So they're the two stories that I've told you. We've been using self-assembled systems to deliver genetic material into, we've got to the stage of animal models, because we want to treat ultimately patients with cystic fibrosis or other genetic conditions, and this is a technology for doing it. And we're self-assembling and fabricating quite complicated gels to grow tissue and cells on them, a patient's own stem cells, and ultimately, 20 years down the line, we'd like to use that to engineer organs. So this is really self-assembled medicine, in a way. So we like to think we've gone from kind of Sam to Super Sam, in a way. And this, for me, is the power of science, right? So I always think this picture is like, an academic or a teacher and a student. You can tell it's a teacher because the teacher's just talking all the time, right? And it's just full of, full of this stuff. And, and of course, it's Calvin, the teacher, telling Hobbes that this transmogrifier will turn you into anything at all. This is science, right? This box. You could do anything with science. You really can. And the teacher, or me, is very excited about certain things. You just set the indicator, the machine automatically restructures your chemical configuration. You could be an eel, a baboon, a bug, or a dinosaur. They're all really exciting things. That's what I'd be excited in being, right? Hobbes is the student. What if you want to be something else? Well, it's very simple. Teachers always have an answer. That's the first thing you'll always know. But the answer is just, well, there's plenty of room on the side. Just write what you want to be, turn the thing round, and you can do it. And science is this box, right? Science is a box that allows you to solve problems. We have ideas of the problems we want to solve. I'd like to be an eel or a baboon. They're the two stories I've told you today. You'll have your own problems that you want to solve maybe one day. And science is a box that allows you to do that. That's the amazing power of it. 
The final thing that I'd like to say just uh, today is that this lecture is in memory of Sam. Ultimately, as I said, cystic fibrosis patients don't live forever. Sam died earlier this year with complications from rejection of his lung transplant. I didn't manage to get anything in the clinic that would help Sam, but we continue doing the research and we hope ultimately that we'll be able to help people with conditions like his through some of the research that we do. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. And thank you very much for being a really attentive audience, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got. Hi, with your DNA, um, the little balls that can attach DNA, where, like, can you can you program it to go to a certain part of DNA, or is it just it goes anywhere? So that's a really good question. Um, it all depends on what you put on the surface of your ball, right? So there are certain units that would like to bind to certain bits of DNA, so something that has lots of guanosine in it or something that has lots of thymidine in it. So you can do that if you choose the right ligand to be on the surface. With the things we put on the surface that are really just positively charged and they sit in the minor groove of DNA, they're not fussy about what bases is near them, so they'll just bind anywhere on the DNA surface. Um, so, but you can, in principle, tune it so that if you have the right things on the surface of your ball, it would only bind to, or bind more strongly to certain bits of the DNA than other bits of the DNA. The other thing you can do by changing the surface, that we also do, is put things on the surface of your ball, as well as the DNA binding bits, that will go and bind to specific cell surfaces. And so you can begin to design a ball that will both bind to the DNA, but also want to take it to the cell surface that has the binding partner to that. So using the surfaces of the balls and modifying them like you suggest is a very powerful approach for doing that. Hi. Hi. Uh, have you ever used CRISPR or Cas9 to do the DNA programming? Yeah, so we're chemists, so we work on the delivery vehicle and then we collaborate with biologists that work on the biology end. So whether they're using DNA, interfering RNA, you're exactly right that now what's hot is CRISPR technology. Actually with CRISPR technology, it has the same problems of trying to get it into cells of patients. If you want to use it in vivo in a patient, there is still a difficulty with getting CRISPR into cells. It's a very good technique in the lab, in vitro, where you can like inject the CRISPR construct into the cell that you're working with, but you suffer similar problems if you're trying to treat a patient with CRISPR. So we haven't collaborated with a CRISPR team and looked at delivering CRISPR. In principle, the kind of things you develop just for standard DNA or siRNA should be translatable across <coughs> to CRISPR as well, but we haven't done that. But like I said, we work on the delivery vehicle end, and ultimately, for things that work well, we'll then go and find collaborators, and CRISPR is one possible thing. We'd go and find a collaborator who specializes in CRISPR, and then we'd see if it assists the delivery of that into cells. It's a good question, because CRISPR is almost certainly where the field of genetic modification is going. I think it's also important, just reflecting historically, like the idea of gene therapy came up in about 1990, and it started off mainly focused around DNA. And DNA has been very difficult to solve. Um, and then people became certain that short interfering RNA was going to solve a lot of those problems. It's no good for cystic fibrosis for quite complicated reasons, but this is a different form of genetic material called RNA, and it goes into the cell and interferes with processes in the cell. And so everybody then focused on short interfering R RNA. And now everyone says, and that's not really, you know, there's bits and bobs in the clinic, but now everyone says it will be CRISPR. And that's also the way that science kind of evolves. Um, and it will be interesting to see where CRISPR actually gets to. Because these problems are quite hard to solve. You know, people have been working on them for 30 years now. And there's only bits and pieces in the clinic still. I think we've got time for one more question. Hi. Um, just about your nonopus yeah. molecule. Um, when it breaks down in the human body, what does it turn into? So the aim is, of course, of all the systems that I've shown you, Anything that you put into a patient, what you want it to break down into is small molecules that are non-toxic and that can be metabolized by the patient. So one of the things that I didn't say, because of time, 
is that the bit on the outside of our nonopus that really binds to the DNA, that's the bit that could potentially cause lots of problems once it's broken down in the body. The, the interior bits are just fragments, and once those break down, they're easily metabolized. You could imagine the binding bit is where the problem is going to be, because if it binds to something, that could be problematic. One of the ideas of our strategy is because we have so many copies of it on the surface, it makes the binding really strong. As you break it down into a single version, the binding is actually quite weak. So it becomes very sort of non-interactive, non-toxic, non-persistent. And the specific compound that we chose was spermine as our ligand. Spermine is present in all of your cells at micromolar levels. It's present in sperm cells at like molar levels. The reason is it plays a role in making, uh, when the sperm and the egg fuse, the spermine binds to the DNA and plasticizes everything uh, during the fertilization process. And spermine is actually the dominant component of human sperm. It's, it was isolated in the 1700s by a Dutch scientist called Van Leeuwenhoek. And we deliberately chose it for the outside bit because it's in all your cells in the body. And so once you've broken it down, What's left is only going to be very similar or less than the amount of that, that you've already got in your cells. Um, we think about those things carefully. It's the same with our, um, our, tissue engineering, our tissue engineering frameworks. Those are all based on sorbitols and sugars, and they should break down into things that are not toxic, and obviously you don't want to kill the cells, and so on and so forth. Oh, let's see. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much to Professor Smith. Thank you very much.